Hey, what's up guys? It's Chris Martin. I'm actually on my way to the very first multifamily investment property that I purchased. It's in one of my favorite cities, Lynn. Let's go check it out. It's cold in these streets. Am I wrong? Am I wrong? Thinking that we could be something for real. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh. I love triple deckers and I wanted the first property that I purchased to be a triple decker. So here it is. I'm standing outside of it right now and it's special to me for a few reasons. One, because it's a triple decker, as I mentioned. And number two, it's in the city that I grew up in, so that's pretty cool. And it was my first multi. After I purchased this three family, a few months later, I was actually able to pick up another multifamily. It was a two unit and it wasn't too far from here. Actually, it was right there. That's right. Right next door, I was able to pick up a two unit. I am going to share exactly how I did that. I'm going to share with you guys exactly how I picked up this triple decker right behind me, how I picked up a two family right next door, and how I turned those five units into 10 income producing units. This is kind of my story. It's not the only way to do this. It's the way that I did it. So don't feel like this is like the end all be all as far as like what you have to do. All right. So um, I'm going to go ahead and kind of just give you a little backstory on myself. Um, that way you guys kind of know like where my mindset and kind of like just my perspective on the decisions I made when I made it, if that's all right. So um, who do we have from Lynn up in here? I know we have a couple of people, right? David. Okay, good. So that's where I grew up, born and raised, went to school there, um, elementary, middle school, high school. Um, I actually moved from Lynn when I was 22, 23. Uh, I moved down to the Gulf Coast. I uh, got a job in radio, so decided to move down there to pursue that industry. Um, and I moved down there 22, 23, so kind of young. I felt like I was like, radio down south is a little different from like radio in other parts of the country, like other parts of the country. You see a radio personality, it's like, uh, whatever. I was like Michael Jackson down there. I was pretty pretty famous, just to let you guys know. Uh, but it was pretty cool. Like, it was a good job in my 20s. Um, even then, I always knew I wanted to be in real estate. So um, I think it was like my first year. I was down there for a full year. And then the apartment that I was in burned down. And um, I didn't really, you know... it me wanting to be a homeowner, it kind of accelerated that process, right? Because I was like, oh, well, it's kind of a blessing because it kind of forced me to get a pre-approval and actually start the house hunting, you know, at 23, 24 years old. So that's what I did. I actually bought uh, a property. Um, the first property I bought was uh, when I was 24. Found something good, Jeff? <laughs> Thanks. Um, so I bought a house. I bought a house for, guess what it was down there in good old uh, Mobile, Alabama on the Gulf Coast. 40, 40, 70, 70, 95. Market was kind of high back then. Market was kind of high back then. But it had a pool. It had a slide. I was 24 years young. I thought I was balling. It was like MTV Cribs for me. I was like, oh, this is crazy. I was coming from an apartment. And I actually got into a mortgage. I was paying less. Then when I was paying for rent from there, the house needed a little bit of work. And that's where kind of my, all those juices started flowing of like the investor, like, and you know, this is it. I could actually like tap into this house and maybe start to do some renovation. So I did, I probably spent about six or seven grand. I did some work myself. I, um, uh, you know, did the floors painted, nothing too crazy. It was just more like cosmetic stuff. I spent six or seven grand, um, and then the, I would probably say like six months later or something, I met a real estate agent. Uh, he was actually working in the barbershop that I used to get my hair cut. I used to get half hair. <laughs> Got to cut the barbershop. Um, and I heard him talking about real estate. And I'm like, oh man, like, you know, let me sell my house, you know? So one thing turned to another. Um, and we put the property on the market. Back then he was just like, what do you want to list it for? Well, I bought it for 95. I put about seven grand into it. I was like, let's throw it out there for 125. Just to like, I had no idea like where the market was. I just threw it out there for 125. I, I felt like the colors I chose were kind of nice. Maybe that would attract some people. I don't know, right? 
Um, and I actually got an offer for 125, got an offer for 125. Um, so I'm like, you know, low 100s into it. Commission down there is like nothing, right? The, your, the agents are going to pay like a couple grand off the sale. So I netted pro- close to $20,000. Um, and that was like my first like taste of the investment world. $20,000 at 24, that was like a million dollars to me. Like 20 grand, 20 grand. Like that was, that, that was like a come up for me because I never had that much money at, at one time as a check. Yeah, like I don't even remember like what I did down there that night, but it was, it was yeah, I was probably spent a good chunk. Yeah, definitely in the club. Even the ugly girls had drinks that night. Everybody was drinking. <laughs> um, so that there sold the house. I went back into an apartment and I was like, you know what? Like, why don't I be involved in the real estate transaction side of it? Because I like real estate. I like the renovating part. Let me get my real estate license. So signed up, got my real estate license. Real estate started becoming more and more of a reality to me. It's like, all right, let me get my license as a backup and see kind of where this goes. So I got my real estate license down there. Um, while I was still on the air and I purchased another property. I was like, I'm just going to keep doing this. If I just keep making $20,000 on the side, this is like, this is a beautiful thing right here. So I purchased another property. Um, and then in 2000 and 2008, um, decided to move back up here. I was in a relationship at the time, started to get serious. I was like, you know what? I'm going to do real estate full time. I'd rather like, I'd rather establish myself back at home. Price points are higher. I'd be able to make more money. So I moved back up here. So that's kind of the backstory to where fast forward. Now I'm full-time into real estate. All right. So I just kind of wanted to give you some backstory and now full-time into real estate, real estate sales. Like for me, like I was, I didn't have any kids at the time. I didn't have, I didn't have much overhead and I knew I had a decent amount of savings still living off that 20 grand. So um, I had a decent amount of savings. I was, I was always like a saver. So for me getting into real estate, I knew it was going to take a while to get up and running. I had a chance to connect with another radio personality who transitioned into real estate and he was killing it. He was making like 250 at that time a year. And he was only like four or five years in the business. So I was like, Oh, if I can just like copy what this dude's doing, I'll be good in a couple of years or I'll be good. You know, it might take me some time. So he lived out in uh, California at the time. I took a flight out there and I basically, I shadowed him for three, four days and just saw exactly what he did and came back and adopted. Remember, this is like day one of me getting into real estate. I wanted to get out there, put myself in the same environment as someone that was doing it successfully. So I did that. I, I, I came back, uh, signed up, got my license here. I did the reciprocal thing where I just had to take the test. Um, this here on the second, on the second uh, bullet point, if you can save more than you spend, like that, real estate's a beautiful thing to where we make big chunks of money at a time. You know, we sell a property, we make five grand, seven grand, 10 grand, 15 grand, 20 grand, whatever it is. There's no need to spend all of that money. We should be saving way more. Like, you know, I don't, people in regular jobs can't do what we do as far as savings. We have a beautiful way to kind of, stash money. So real estate, I would encourage you guys to, uh, to do that. Um, it's a good way to save money. I wanted to identify and target uh, property. So just to kind of give you perspective, my first year in the business, I probably did like three or four properties. It was nothing like spectacular. I didn't have any leads given to me. I didn't have like, I wasn't part of a team or had an opportunity. Teams were kind of starting to evolve back then. Um, but I, I had, it was all self-generated. So those three or four transactions, it was tough to keep my head above water, but I knew like, give it some time. Second year, it turned into about 10 to 12 transactions. Third year was like 15 and then fourth year, 20 plus. And I was kind of right in line with my, my boy where he was in his business his fourth year. So it kind of worked out. Um, so the real estate sales side, you guys get a sense of that. So if it was up to me, owner occupying multis is the way to go. If you can buy a property up to a four unit and owner occupy it, 
you're going to be able to save a ton of money on your down payment and your closing costs. All right. So for those that don't have property yet or are able to put themselves in a situation to where they can purchase a property, that's really the route you want to take. Um, in my situation, I actually bought a single family house first. Um, if I wanted to get married, that was the only route I could have taken. Um, so um, that's the route that I took. So um, I had to basically save up for 25% down. So it, it took me, I feel, a little bit longer because of that reason. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So FHA, yeah. I was going to say, you can also do the single family and have you know, rooms rented out. I did that for a while. Yeah. Kind of a pain in the ass, but I mean, they paid for the mortgage. I don't love tenants. I don't love roommates. But yeah, you know, you know, I did that when I was like 22. And my mortgage was fully paid for. And you live by yourself? Um, yeah. Well, me and all my a bunch of friends. I don't know over time. But yeah. I love. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. I mean, if I was like, if I was single, or if it was just me, I would do that all day long. I would put myself in a position and you know leverage off of of tenants and be able to it's a, it's to a do that. To a girlfriend and wife. That yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Go, so. I, yeah, I mean, growing up in Lynn, my, my wife grew up in Lynn too. And it's like, we, we were born and raised in multifamilies. You know, I grew up in an eight unit that we didn't own. We were tenants our whole lives. And it's like, finally, when we're in a position to buy, it's like, we're trying to get the hell up out of that situation to, you know, to, um, to be in our own space. So definitely a hard sell. Um, so I said, save five to 7% of the purchase price. Like, oh, well, Chris, three and a half percent down. You can kind of get into a property but you're still going to have closing costs. You're still going to have to have reserves on top of that as far as being able to carry it. So I would say five to 7%. If you can get into an FHA loan, great. Uh, and I think you should try to get an FHA loan because that's, you know, probably the best bet as far as like money up, at, up front at the closing, but overall five to 7% of the purchase price, um, FHA loan, closing costs, reserves, but I think conservatively, you know, six months is kind of a good, uh, a good um, emergency repairs, vacancies, you know, just to carry yourself where you don't have to worry about that. Um, I, I always like the idea of, and, and I, I set up a separate account altogether for each, you know, property that way, you know, you build your reserves in there and it doesn't feel like it's money out of your pocket. Because if it's all commingled in that one account, when you write in that check, you're like, you're writing the check and it, it feels like you're paying for it. But if it's a separate account, it almost feels like you're not paying for it. So it, it's kind of like, um, to me at least, it, 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 it works. I was looking up property yesterday. So this is last night, average three unit in the last six months in Haverhill, 575. All right, not bad. Not bad when you look at surrounding areas. So um, depending on where you guys are looking to buy, I would start to look at these average price points because it's gonna give you a target to aim for. Because in real estate, you know, and in life, all we have is time. So you have, this is the fresh start to 2022. What's your goals for the year? If you don't know the numbers you need to hit, then you're, what are you aiming for, right? I mean, you, you, you might achieve those numbers, but you may not even know it. Um, so for this property, we're looking at approximately $41,000 for you to save up for the, to, to put yourself in that 5 to 7% to purchase the property. In real estate, how many transactions is for about 41, 41K? Real estate, how many transactions? Think about that. Like how, how feasible is that? We're talking about potentially being able to save up this down payment in like less than a year if you're hustling, right? If you're out there working in real estate, is that unrealistic? Please say no. No, it's not, right? I mean, 41K versus 144 if you were saving for, you know, that 25% down. Yeah. Um, I, I heard something somewhere where I've never seen it actually this practice, but essentially when you're an agent, you can put your buyer commission as toward, you know as part of the down payment, which actually is something like 2%. Yeah. And you could put that number down to, you know, significantly less than that. Yeah. I mean, as a real estate agent, you know, you have flexibility that other people don't have as buyers, you know, especially if it's off market. If it's on market and there's a, a a commission being offered to you, then the brokerage it should go through the brokerage and you should it should be the 80-20 split or whatever that is. However, if it's off market and there's not a commission being offered, that's totally you you have way more freedom to negotiate that with the homeowner and being like, okay, well, I'd like to purchase this property. 
let me just, um, you know, if you put it on the market, you're probably going to be charged four or five percent. I'll only charge you three percent. You know, we can just go direct through me um, and I'll charge you that commission. Take the commission or you can say, you know, instead of taking the commission, why don't we just have a credit back to me at closing for that, whatever that equates to. So off market, definitely a lot more flexibility there than it being on MLS and there's a compensation being offered. Um, so yeah, so 41K for a property in Haverhill, start to look up the areas that you guys are interested in and, and see what those average price points are because you know those numbers are, are real numbers and that's like today. So prices were lower before, yeah, I mean, it, you know, there's never a, there's never a good time or a bad time. It's like the time is like when you're ready to buy, like if you're ready to buy something, especially if you're doing a, we're talking about buy and holds for the most part here. So in a buy and hold, it doesn't have to be as rigid as it would be on like a fix and flip, right? When you're on a fix and flip, it's like every dollar matters. And I'm not saying every dollar doesn't matter here. But it's more of like, if it makes sense, does the rents are collected or that you will collect, does it make sense? Like, is the profit level there? Is it going to carry the mortgage? Are you going to have some profit from that? Um, you have more flexibility there. So I wouldn't worry about where the market is and trying to hang for, you know, the market to turn around. I would say like, if you're ready, like even 575, that's not a bad price for a three unit, you know, considering like what you can get for rents in Haverhill, like that's, it's pretty good. So one thing that, you know, I learned really quickly is like, you know, some agents will advertise their properties as like, here's a three unit, plenty of room for rental increase. And they almost put it out there as a positive. It's like mm -hmm. that rental increase could take years, yeah. right? Because like, if you think about a tenant, how long is it going to take them to get out? Then you renovating the unit. And then, you know, there's all types of, you know, configuration that goes on with that. So uh, it can be done. But I think like Marco said, you should, you know, consider that upfront. And the price should be kind of related to that. Um, you know, ideally, you have like perfect tenants that are paying top dollar for rent. It's not, it's not, it's not the case in almost ever that you're going to have top dollar rent, top quality tenants. Usually, you're going to have some legacy tenants or some lifers or whatever you're going to call them. They're there and they're going to be paying much below market. You can't go in there and be like, hey, Marcos, you're paying $1,200. You know, market rate is... 2000, I'm going to increase your rent from 1200 to $2,000. It doesn't work like that. Who can afford $2,000 that's only paying 1200? Almost nobody. Going into your offer, you should already have like an idea of like your game plan of like the situation. So like when, when I go look at a property, if it's a multi-unit, it's like, I'm looking at everything. I'm looking at who's home during the day. You know what I mean? Like if they're home during the day, they're not working. Like, what's up with that? That might be yeah. flag number one, right? Uh, you know, so I actually planned on, uh, and I'll answer the question, but I plan on doing like a more like thorough class on like how to get rents from here to here and like strategies and all that. All right. So identifying and targeting a property, uh, for a multifamily is obviously a goal for me. It's like, how can I get into a multifamily? I wanted a triple decker. I wanted a three unit. I knew that's what I wanted. So I just started to try to identify which ones I would like to buy or would see myself purchasing. The conversation started to shift. Remember, I'm a real estate agent, right? Now the conversation is not, hey, Rob, do you want to sell your house? It's like, I'm a real estate agent, yes, but I'm, I would love to talk to you about maybe buying your property. Like, would you be interested in like having that conversation and hearing what I would buy for your, you know, your house? You know, Ocean City Development does it all the time. I wanted to come from more of like a personal type of approach where it was like an individual rather than, you know, uh, a company buying the property and not to say one way is better than the other, but I just thought that that was like how I wanted to approach it. Um, so I was driving for dollars. I started literally writing down addresses of properties that I would see myself buying. Um, and I did MLS searches for property style so I could identify all the triple deckers um in inland and see who was absentee owners who lived in the building uh because the absentee owners uh a lot of them live in that area there might be someone who owns a property on chatham street that lives on you know western ave or something so i started to basically call and door knock these people 
that uh, the ones that didn't live in the area, reach out to them. The ones that did just knock on their door and just introduce myself. Um, that's how I purchased my first property, uh, my first multifamily property. Um, I, I had a conversation with someone at the door. Uh, they were a little skeptical at first. This is like a, you know, black dude showing up at their door. Like, who is this dude? Right. But I'm like, Hey, like, you know, they, I, I, I pitched my case and told them, you know, who I was. Um, and they told me, they were like, Oh, well, we, um, we actually have been thinking about selling, but if you want the listing, like we already have an agent that would list and sell the property for us. So I just want to let you know, cause they thought it might've been some sort of bait and switch type of thing. Um, I was like, no, you know, that's fine. I respect that. Um, you know, can I take a look at the building? So looked at the building. Uh, at that time, market value was probably like mid to like low to mid fours was probably like the, the market value for a triple decker in Lynn at that time. And that was like, I don't know, maybe like 2016 or something. Um, crazy, right? From where it is today, like that triple decker is like mid eights. <laughs> um, so we agreed on a price. I'm like, hey, like, let's just say, like, if you were to list it, it's going to be 400 if you were to list the property. Like, that's what you would list it for. Because you're not being charged commission, do you mind passing those savings on to me as a buyer? You know, and I'm, and we can deal with each other direct, you know. Um, they're like, sure, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll do that, make it easy. They don't have to bother the tenants. They had some legacy tenants in there. And by the way, their lifer tenants were like lifer tenants. It was one lady paying uh, $625 for, for her unit. Um, Ethel, she was about $109. Um, sweet lady. Um, and there was another guy upstairs who was a vet. He was paying like $750. And there was another unit, you know, uh, I forget what they were paying, but it was all like below a thousand dollars. All of them. Um, I told her I would assume the tenants, all of them. Um, so she liked that. So three seventy five. I assume the tenants. I get an inspection. Uh, the inspection. I go down there and I forget what it was, but. Um, I basically renegotiate for like an extra like five or 10 grand or something to apply towards my closing cost. Uh, Cause the inspection, like I got like a really good write up on it and they were actually there during the inspection. And all the time, like when I teach classes, I'm like, I use inspectors that are non alarmists. I chose an alarmist <laughs> inspector, right? Cause I, I, I wanted all that. I wanted like them to be like, oh, this is crazy. What is going on in here, right? And the owners were like, oh damn, oh damn. <laughs> so when I asked for 10 grand, they were like, yeah, yeah, that's fine, that's fine. Don't worry about it. <laughs> so I definitely chose like someone who I knew was gonna be like, oh, I would never use them for my buyer, but for me, they were cool. <laughs> the alarmist, yeah. Oh, there's, there's more alarmist inspectors, inspectors and non-alarmists, but. Right. Yeah. Um, so renegotiated 370 um, or they might've been like five and five. So I think we reduced the price five and then a closing cost five. Um, I took on the property. Um, I vacated the first floor um, within about 30 to 45 days. Um, I actually had them give the heads up to the first floor um, and by the time, like I closed, they were kind of already packing and stuff like that. So I renovated that unit from top to bottom. I probably spent about 20 grand in there, updated the electrical bathrooms, like kitchen. Like I did, I did a good amount of work for 20 grand. Um, and then I got market rate for that. Um, upstairs, I increased the rent from Ethel 109. Um, I took all of her life savings. No, I'm just kidding. I, didn't do that. I wouldn't do that to her. I was like, Hey, what do you think is fair, you know, to come up here? So she, um, and, and by the way, like for me, like I've already like dumped a bunch of money into that building. I put 25% down cause I didn't live in the building. I was already like scrapping. I wasn't trying to vacate anyone else, at least at that particular time. So when she said she would stay, increase the rent, I didn't have to do anything. That was like perfect for me. So we increased the rent, I want to say to like 1100 or something. 
Um, so it was a good, it was a good increase for her. And then upstairs we did the same thing. Um, so I did that eventually Ethel passed away, God bless mm -hmm. her soul. Um, and we renovated the second unit, same thing. I got market rent and then, um, the vet just stayed there. The vet is still a lifer, still stays there to this day. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> And he was like, again, during that walkthrough, I was like, oh man, like this dude's gonna be hard to get out. He has like, he's like a prepper. So he's got all types of stuff everywhere. Like, it's like, oh man, he's a good, he's a good dude though. Um, you know, he would always give me calls and be like, hey, Chris, I've just seen someone come downstairs. Never seen him in the building before. I'm just letting you know. I'm just letting you know. I'm like, all right, cool. Keep an eye out, keep an eye out. Thanks, man. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> But I also had a town like, what'd you say? I hope it wasn't the ghost of Ethel. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Uh, that's funny. Um, I'm thinking of I know, right? <laughs> Damn. Oh my so I was starting to think like, all right, so I saved up enough money to purchase this property. Now I'm like, I know that I want to, I know I want to buy more. It so happens that I was continuing sort of that process of like door knocking and cold calling for real estate sales, but also for myself. Like the ones that I identified, I was having those conversations with myself. The dude right next door owned a two family and he lived in Maine. And I was like, hey man, anytime that you wanna, you know, if you're thinking about sound, let me know, let me know. Um, that was like the initial conversation. Um, I got his number cause I seen him working out there one day and I was like, hey, well, you know, I just, I just purchased the property next door, you know, how's the neighborhood, making small talk, whatever, whatever. Um, he was like, no, no interest, no interest. I was like, all right, cool. So he said he was going to do a couple of projects around the house. I probably checked in with them probably like three times, like just through like text messages, like, Hey, like any house projects coming up, or I seen a couple of guys out, like whatever, just like, just reaching out to them. Not necessarily saying you still want to sell. He reached out to me one day in a full blown panic. I don't know what he was going on in his life, but he was like, Chris, you still want to buy the property? It sounded like he was getting chased. I was like, yo, well, what's going on right now? He's like, do you still want to buy the property? I was like, yeah, I still want to buy the property. Um, and he's like, how much you want to buy it for? I'm like, well, what do you, well, what do you have in mind for a price? I'm like, right, right, like negotiation rule number one, like let them come to the table with a, a price, right? So what do you have in mind for a price? In my mind, I had already like run numbers on this property. And I'm like, all right, if this dude says anything like in that, like three to 350, you know, three, you know, if any or anything around there, I'm like, I'm in. So he's like, I was thinking like 250. I was like, so it, it, the deal wouldn't have happened if he if he saw my face. Like if we were FaceTiming, the deal wouldn't have happened. Cause I was like, oh, oh, <laughs> I like, oh damn. So I was like, all right, let me, let me, let me keep poker face. I was like, all right, hold on. I was like, yeah, I'm gonna have to think about that. I'm gonna need to call back. I was like, oh man, this is great. He was over there, you hot beat. Yeah, I was like, oh man, this is awesome. So what's that? No, this was after this. So it must've been like 2000 and like, 16 17 oh wow yeah so called him back i was like yeah 250 is a little high for me i was like i'm thinking maybe like 240 he's like all right 240 is good i was like all right good so i was like i won't do an inspection like um oh he had one unit was vacant and he had this like tenant in there that was like i knew they were like yeah, there's gonna be hell getting them out of that. I was like, hey, do you think you can get that tenant like out of there? Like, you know, by the time we close? And he said, yeah. So I was like, oh, great. So sweet. I was like, don't worry about anything though during the transaction. Like I'll do everything. Like I'll do, you know, smoke, sir. I'll do all that stuff. Like I'll do the final utilities. Like, don't worry about anything. Like, you know, just try to get that tenant out and meet me at the closing and you, you'll get your money, right? So he lived in Maine um, and I need to get this offer signed. He's like, yeah, yeah, I'll sign it. I'm coming up there this weekend. And it must've been like early in the week. I'm like, no, where were you at, man? He's like, oh, I'm in May. I was like, you know what? I'm gonna be in the area. I'm gonna be in the area. You know damn well I was gonna be in no damn Maine, but I was like, I'm gonna be in the area. Flew down there, got the offer signed. And um, actually I went right into PNS. So we went right into PNS and, and it was secure. Um, got to the closing table 
And check this out. This guy comes with a closing. What did it appraise for? It appraised for, I don't want to say appraised for like low th three. It wasn't like crazy. It only appraised for like three-ish. I forget, but it wasn't like anything like crazy, crazy. So just to go back, so down payment for that property. How did I get the down payment for that property? From I didn't sell it yet. Didn't do a cash out refi. I didn't have, I didn't move in there. I didn't have an equity line of credit. You brought the bank. partner? <laughs> What'd you say? You brought the bank. Right? You got to hire someone with a 401k. Or All those things could have been good possibilities. Uh, this is not something that I recommend doing, but um, I, uh, and I don't forget what the down payment was. Like it wasn't crazy because I mean, 20, 240 times 25%. It's like 60, 60 ish grand or whatever that I needed to come up with 60, 70 with closing costs or whatever. Um, but my real estate sales were like good at that time, but it was like, I just renovated that unit over there. Like I was still scrapping to try to get some of that funding back. So I decided to use my tax account money. Um, again, not something I recommend at all. So this is not saying that you guys should go out there and do that. Uh, but I always kept things separate to where like I had, you know, every check that I had, I'd put, I'd put away a third into a separate account that I would use for taxes. And that would be my tax money. And, and I, when this deal came up, I was like, where am I going to get this money? It's like, Oh, my tax money. I was like, I'm going to do, I'm going to, I'm going to borrow it. You know, I'm, I'm going to use that. So I did. Um, thankfully it worked out, but that could have put me in a bad situation. I think that year, like it wasn't too far from like tax uh taxes being like done you know i usually do them in like march because that's what I, that's what real estate agents do right you do them in march by that time like i had enough like accumulation in that tax account to have like something to dip into so yeah so i i was like all right let me do that and i'll just figure out tax i'll just figure that out like i'll just try to get a couple closings and just try to like scrum up the money or whatever whatever <laughs> like taxes came i ended up doing like payment plan with that to like get myself back up to uh to speed and even myself out but um it worked out because at that point i i, I renovated both units um mm -hmm. and i was able to get market rent on both <clears throat> units because both units were vacant and there wasn't a whole lot of work outside of like some cosmetic stuff that needed to be done. So that's how I basically got the five units, uh, both off market um, and off market to me is the best because you don't have any market history on MLS as well. Right. Because if I purchase those properties on market and then I'm turning around and selling them like within whatever amount of time, there's always those, you know, there's, there's a previous listing that someone could always look up. So these properties had no previous listings. So that was a benefit um, and a huge advantage. So um, I started collecting rent for a little bit. I was like, oh, this is nice. You know, my mortgage for the two family was like, it was like 1500 bucks or something like that. So um, that was sweet. But I was like, you know what? I'm going to sell the three unit because I want to be able to just cash out. Like at that point, it was, it might've been a couple of years later. Uh, the property was worth like, you know, pretty much seven. So I was like, oh man, like I only owe three on it. Let me just take that money and flip it into something else. I didn't want to sell that property. So um, oh, just to go back real quick on identifying, I did some mailers as well, um, just to like a hyper-focused list of mailers to like the people that I, were that I was identifying uh, on properties I would buy. All right, so selling a property I didn't want to sell. So, I mean, that was, to me, that was, I wanted to buy a property in Lynn and I had to like remember like, all right, what's my goal here? Is my goal to like, own property in Lynn or is it to accumulate units? And to me, I was like, it's to accumulate units. So sold that property. I wanted to do a 1031 and roll it into another property. Um, but I also didn't want to rush into another property and you have to be able to identify a property in a certain time frame and all that stuff if you're doing a 1031 exchange to avoid capital gains. So I wasn't, I wasn't able to identify a property. Um, I just wanted to you know, find the right deal. I wanted to find another off market deal. I wasn't, I didn't want to like go on market. I was like, Oh, I've been purchasing all my properties off market. Let me try to keep it that way. So, um, turns out, um, a six unit came available. Um, and this is not, this is probably 2019 at this point, a six unit became available in Haverhill, uh, for how much guess six units, 675. I think I bought it for 675. 
the numbers made sense to me to where it was like, I knew what my expenses were going to be. I knew what the current rents were. Um, and I had a game plan on like the worst units I wanted to get out. So I did that. Um, and I actually vacated two units within the first like 60 days and they were the worst of the units and I was able to renovate them and get market for those two units. Um, and the other units I gave like small increases to, um, and then eventually I got a third unit out and, uh, brought that one up to market too, but, um, purchased that property, um, off market agent to agent relationships are, are huge, right? Because you can find, what you can find just by the, the manpower that you put out there and the marketing that you put out there. But it's also like talking to people that are also doing the same thing as you, right? Because I could be talking to, to you and maybe there's a three unit that you come across in Chelsea that you were thinking about buying, but it's not going to be a fit for you for whatever reason. And it's off market. Well, you're like, oh, I, just, I just talked to a seller. Like maybe it's somewhere where you can still benefit from getting a commission now, you know, and you can still like at least get something from the transaction. So don't, you know, don't be shy to like talk about what you're looking for to other agents. I mean, we have the, the we have a great amount of agents here at, at Cameron, you know, 300 plus, but it's also outside agents too. Like you can have that conversation with anyone. That one was an agent that had that property and they were going to go to market, but because of the relationship that we had, I was like, hey, like if I give you guys an offer, you still get paid. They don't have to worry about, especially there's something about like owners and not wanting to bother their tenants, right? Because that's like something that's like a huge fear is like they do, it's not like a single family do an open house and there's cookies and balloons and stuff. They don't want any of that stuff. They want a silent buyer for the most part, because the worst case scenario for them is they bring a potential buyer in, they stop paying rent, they start getting scared. What's gonna happen with this new buyer? It could mess up their circumstances. I don't know how many times I went through property and before I go in, they're like, uh, I told them you're an insurance adjuster. Okay. Okay. <laughs> right, come on. You know, like, it's like, oh, whatever, whatever, you know? So they're always trying to disguise you from being like the new buyer. And then when you buy the property, they're like, I thought you were the insurance adjuster, right? Uh, Sight. Um, <laughs> so would you say your, your journey of turning five into 10 was more of a longer term journey of market appreciation and your own appreciate forced appreciation of the work you've done for me it was mainly savings right because if you look at like the market appreciation it did you know I, it helped me kind of turn that three into six but mm -hmm. i certainly could have like refinanced out of that or i could do some other options or mm -hmm. i could use my tax money again or like you know whatever like i could have i think like for me like i still feel like my wife tells me this all the time. She's like, oh man, like you're, you're cheap. I was like, I don't think I'm cheap, you know, but I think like in a way, like I was born and raised in Lynn and not the best circumstances. Like I still feel like I operate from like being broke in a way, you know what I'm saying? Like I get nervous when I spend a lot of money, I'm putting in a big pool and I'm like sweating, like, oh man, like <laughs> this is too much money I'm spending. But I feel like um, that mentality a level of that needs to come like with uh, with most agents. Like if you're, you need to operate, in my opinion, like you're at zero. Because if you feel like you're good, I got a couple closings pending. I have plenty of clients in the pipeline. I got money in my bank, my whatever. It's like, to me, like there's no, there's no sense of urgency with that. Like I like having the pressure on my back. I feel like I operate the best that way. So I still like kind of live that to this day is like, I feel like, I'm kind of at zero. I think if you can save a good chunk of your real estate money, we talked about the 575 in Haverhill, $41,000, you know, sell six houses, you have yourself a down payment to buy that property. And then from there, maybe the market helps you, maybe it doesn't, maybe you just have to repeat that process. But I always kind of had in the mind, if I could buy like one property a year, like that's like, I'm good with that. You know what I mean? So one year, could I save $41,000? Definitely. And then I don't have to worry about whether I can refinance or not, whether I have to have like market pre like I could just save money, 41 grand, you make a hundred grand, you could save 41 K that's, you know, you spend, spend the rest 59, you could live off $59,000 in my opinion. I thought I was going to own that multi and Lynn forever. I really did. But then like, as I got it up and running, as I saw some of like the rental income, I had to remind myself, like, what's the goal here and what's the quickest way to get to that goal. 
Like I could have still owned that property, but maybe it would have took me longer to get the six. I would have got the six, but it probably would have took me longer. So now I have a, yeah, I gave up a property. I sold it for seven. That's now worth 850. But I also purchased a six that also like increased in, because I would have been like jumping off a building if I didn't purchase something else. If I just sold and like, let it be. Now it's now that's like the mindset because I, I still feel like I'm in the early stages of an investor, but that was my first property. So it wasn't like clear to me. I'm like, all right, let me do this, 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 and then wait six months, refinance, whatever. It just wasn't as clear. Now it's like, I'm always looking for like, all right, what's the market value on the property I own now? Can I do I have enough money to pull out? You know, what, what can, what's the play here? The Burr strategy for just to go over it, uh, the, the idea is to buy a property, to renovate it, uh, to rent it and refinance, to basically use that deposit that you pull, put into that money and keep using that same deposit on, on other purchases. So you kind of recycle your deposit. Because remember, 25% down is a lot of money. So instead of coming up with another 25% down, you're basically just taking the 25%, extracting it and plugging into another property, extracting it, plugging into another property, extracting it and put it, plug it into another property. And in order to do that, you basically have to like increase the property value, which is why you renovate uh, rent and your, you know, your cash flow increases and the property value goes up. Yeah, you force an equity into the property. Um, but yeah, I think the birth strategy is great. Um, and I, I think it's, it's, it's a nice, like conservative way to kind of, uh, to kind of go. So the two family I had did the same thing, end up selling that property. Uh, I remember I had, I bought it for 240. Uh, I forget what my, you know, 240 minus like 60 or whatever is what I owed on it. So it was like next to nothing. Uh, two family and Lynn sold that uh, for five and a quarter. Um, of course, if I would have waited later, would have got more money, but it's all relative to the situation. So same type of thought of like, let me buy something else, but I didn't want to rush it. I wanted to wait for another off market opportunity yeah. and and however long that would take i kind of wait and see um and then i got one i got an uh, off market property methuen um this wasn't too long ago i actually just closed it um earlier uh last year I closed on that one for seven and a quarter um and i liked that building because the setup it's kind of like you know seven and a quarter for a four family i didn't you know it's like it was kind of high for me, at least thought process, like, oh, it seems kind of high, but the numbers work because those is two one bedrooms on the, on the bottom floor and then two, um, three bedrooms on the top. And it was kind of set up like a duplex. And it was nice because the bottom levels, they had a sun porch and they had access to the basement on either side. They had their own private laundry. And then the top floors were two levels and they had their own private laundry and they had two bathrooms. So I was like, oh, this is like a kind of a, a dope setup here like I, I would live here i got the bottom units delivered vacant which were the two one bedrooms apar apartments i did like a quick cleanup in there um you know paint i did redo one of the bathrooms other than that like i kept like everything and you know just did like a cleanup um and rented those out i'm at like just under 1500 for the one bedroom units and then i have one unit that i just got um vacated on the top floor one of the three bedroom units it's a three bedroom and one and a half bath. So I'm um, thinking that I could probably get like somewhere in that 2100 range. So yeah, I mean, based on like some of the rents, it looks like I can like 2000, like in that ballpark should be pretty feasible. Like, I don't think I should like struggle with that. So um, that would be three units that are like uh, market value. I have bought in a few out of state properties as well, where, you know, those are going to be like super affordable to where, um, you know, I purchased them cash to where I didn't have to like worry about coming up with the extreme down payment and I didn't have any debt tied to my name. For me and like what I feel like is feasible in my situation is to get something and kind of like have the market appreciate itself over time and grow into it and still not be like, you know, I could still buy a four unit for, you know, low sevens rather than, you know, a million dollars or whatever. Do you still keep up with the Gulf Coast market? Investing. Yep, I do. Um, I have a friend that um, she lives in Louisiana. She just bought a property. She called me. She's like, Chris, should I buy this property? Um, she's like, here are the numbers. It's a, it's a long-term tenant. Uh, they stay there forever. So I'm automatically going to get cash flow. I think they were paying her like, it was like 600 bucks a month or 550 or something like that. Um, taxes on properties down there are ridiculously low. Mm -hmm. So like we're talking about like 500 $600 for the year. 
for the property, for property taxes down there. She was like, the property is listed for $25,000. I'm like, say no more. <laughs> like, <laughs> buy that shit. Uh, <laughs> so she called me a couple of days later. She was like, oh, I got an accepted offer for 20. I was like, oh man. Again, like a couple transactions you're in and, and you have like no debt tied to your name. Um, it's not going to have like a super amount of like appreciation. I think that's like the diversity of like how you, how you invest. Like, I don't want to go full fledged investing down there because what's that $20,000 property going to be worth 10 years from now, 26, <laughs> 20, you know, 32, I'm just playing, but if this, you guys understand, like if you buy a property here for seven and a quarter, like it will be worth a million dollars at some point, or at the very least, if it's worth seven twenty five and you have it paid off, that's like the worst case scenario. You said you found it um, off market. What was like, how did you find it? Agent. Agent. Okay. Yeah. So the last two properties I purchased were, were agent, um, agent um, relationships. And it's just like, Hey, if you ever see something, let me know. Um, so yeah. So if you guys ever see something, let me know. Uh, <laughs> and that's why I love about four units too. It's because you have that protection of like, is it yeah. likely that all three tenants don't pay? Yeah. That's like not as likely as a situation. Like, do you have one vacancy here, one tenant paying not here and there? But that should be spread out, especially if you're like being strategic about it. All right, that's pretty much it. And like I said from the beginning, this is my story. It doesn't mean it's the only story, but this is my story on how I turned five units into 10. So hopefully you were able to pick up a few things. Uh, maybe some of these things you were thinking about already. Maybe you weren't, uh, but definitely use this to your advantage. Uh, I'm hoping that it did help at least some degree. I wanted to leave you guys with a few things. I wanted to leave you guys with making sure that you guys have a plan. Uh, whatever plan it is, whether it makes sense or not, whether you know it makes sense, have a plan. Uh, be patient with that plan and show some effort. Bring some effort to the table because what you don't hear, uh, part of this story, or at least a lot of the story, has to do with grind and effort. So it's about plugging in that grind, plugging in that effort, and just really working hard. So that's the part that a lot of people don't like to hear. A lot of this came with hard work and effort. When you talk about my sales career, the commissions that I've earned, it was all a grind. It was all a Monday through Friday grind. I didn't do this part time. I jumped in full time. Not to say that you can't do a part time, but just understand the process and love in the process. Fall in love with that the hard work that you're putting into it because it just makes the uh, the finish line that much better when you cross it, all right? So hopefully you guys learned something from it. I'll talk to you guys soon. Peace. Still, I don't want to hear it if it ain't about so the money, am I wrong? wrong?